So today I begin this subject on God's blueprint for the family. And uh, <clears throat> I want to say that under the subject blueprint, the word blueprint is basically for those who are engineers or architects, say a design. There is a design for everything that you need to do. You get to a house, they normally draw for you, and then somebody follows to ensure that it's been done well. When you do that, you help even the people who come after, you know, an architect could pass on, could change jobs. Somebody should follow the design for the it to be able to have posterity or continuity. When I was taking over the senior pastor of this place, and actually the other day when men were contributing for the gate B, I realized that we wanted to put our gate B somewhere on this, uh, on this compound. And the advisor asked me, where is the master plan of this compound? And I went and looked for it in the safe. And guess what I found? Only two structures in this compound have followed the master plan of Sitom Eldoret, this church and the toilets. The rest of the things are out of place. And can tell you how dangerous a master plan, if it's not followed, can be. I was wondering, how comes we are struggling to get where the gate be? The gate be is supposed to be somewhere closer where the youth church is. And so it can't be there. In fact, to do there, there are many other things that have been done around that place. I will not tell you what is supposed to be where the classrooms are, but I can dare tell you it is very dangerous and almost tra uh, tragic for you not to follow a certain plan. Now, as we sit, by the way, I have reconstituted a committee that's going to be led by Engineer Kimodo to redesign again the master plan of this place. God will not give you that chance. He is a master planner. Once he did it, that so that team are going to actually going to have one of their term of reference is to review again and redraw the master plan of Sitom Eldoret. So it's good to follow the master plan. Things may go worse, and it is expensive actually to redraw. I can tell you actually this is supposed to be a place where we are supposed to be doing wedding loans, where the classrooms are. So imagine we have to remove them to follow the plan. You see how it's expensive it is if we don't follow the prescription? Today, I want to tell you God has a blueprint for the family. If we don't follow it, we will always use a lot to repair, and sometimes it can be uh, almost suicidal. A family in this context is defined as a smallest unit of a society where parents and children live together. I'll be able to redefine it further because as we sit here, our children are with us and they live with us at home. A family was defined as parents and children, or a parent could be one parent, or where a community of people could be together, that is a family. And the family could either be nuclear, either father, mother, and children. It's just a small basic unit of three people, or three groups, or even two. We could talk of father and mother. In some cases, could be father and children. That is a nuclear family, having at least uh, those compositions that are mentioned there. It could also be extended. Extended, some of you know, uncles, aunties, grandparents, servants, and in-laws. Actually, in the past service, I mentioned that the nuclear family sometimes and many times in the current setup, it has a servant. So the nuclear family, again, in many of us, it has a servant. So that's a nuclear family. A servant, you have a maid servant, a man servant, the nanny and other people that live with you to help work, that could still be kind of a nuclear family. But we want to consider servants in this sermon as also part of our family. And no, I mentioned in the past service that sometimes many of us who have our, our workers, when they make for us food, I went someplace, you realize you have very good plates, you serve yourself, but the nanny, you consider them to be part of maybe an animal. <laughs> they have another small plate. They normally serve and they go to sit in the kitchen, maybe on a jerry can as they eat. They are part of us. They are supposed to eat with us on the table. You don't need actually to ask them to go and you eat first and they eat after. You know, some of us do that. I want to beseech you that I will consider servants. So if you are a servant living with somebody in this place, I want to incorporate you in the consideration of family. But more importantly is that I will look at family again as a way in which God was able to design it 
as a marriage. It begins from marriage, and that is where we want to begin. And so let me read Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, you can turn with me to be our main scripture. Uh, <clears throat> Mark chapter 10. If you are there, say amen. If you are not there, say wait. There are some people who are saying wait in a low voice. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 to 8, the Bible says this. Um, let, me read from, um, let me read from verse 1. Let me read from verse 2. Let me read from verse 2 of chapter Mark because I will be making some inferences from there. And I will read up to, um, up to verse, um, up to verse uh, 11 or verse 12 there. Let me read up to verse 12. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied, They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because of your hearts, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation, you need to know, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. When they were in a house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Father, we thank you for your word. Now, as we reflect on your design for marriage, I pray that indeed you bless our hearts. Help us to understand all that you desire us to understand in this, that we may solidify our marriages and walk with you. In Jesus' name, we pray. One of the things even myself I struggle with is whether I need to tell you the truth or I tell you the things you know and you have taken to be common and acceptable in our society. Jesus, when speaking with the disciples, they retreat and ask him about the divorce, which is so prevalent currently. And it seems like people were issuing up certificate of divorce. And Jesus reinforces and talks about that a family began with a male and female, that one and each left their parents and the two became one. And so he brings in the idea that a family begins at the point of marriage. While many of us and some of us could not be in ideal marriage or otherwise we've been separated or divorced, Jesus reinforces and he say that when two people are together in their marriage, then they remain to be and nothing can separate them, including divorce. That's why he says, and whoever has divorced his wife and that wife and that husband gets married, married again, he commits adultery. So if you are today here and you are separated, you are divorced, you are married. It's only that you are not living with your spouse. I told you that I'm a study of African religion. Actually, some many tribes in this country actually don't have the vocabulary of divorce, including our college in here. That's why when the wife was bringing problems, they would just leave that wife and, with a homestead and remarry another one. They don't go there. <laughs> they didn't divorce. They kept them. And so you have someone who has two wives in English in polygamy, but in their language, it's there. And if you die and you divorce them, you are buried there. Some of you who come from the Lua land, when your wife who goes away and you pay dowry, and they die from their homes, and that day they die, they remember you paid dowry. They will bring you back to your husband, or else the Samkawas were to be returned. Now, you see that thing is very interesting, but I want to preach to you the Bible. Jesus reinforces and he says, once you get in the situation of marriage, you are still married, so long as your spouse is married. Now, whether they are living with you or they are apart, that needs to sink in our mind as we go this particular afternoon. I should emphasize that part of what I will share today also is our position as a church. God is an architect of the family. As we have read in this place, 
He has a blueprint where a man and a woman were the beginning of a family. And he had a specific design. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, that what does it say? Can we read Genesis chapter 2, verse 22? Because there are only two verses I need to lay a foundation, then we move very fast. Then the Lord made a woman from the rib he had taken out of a man, and he brought her to the man. It is God who actually had a specific way of a man and a woman be married, and no other, not woman, woman, or male, and male. In his specific design, we see a creation story that a man was alone, and God produced a woman or a lady from the rib. Why did he do that? To depict interdependence. Interdependence means that they both were to depend on one another, and that is why we have the siring of children coming from a family, a man and a woman. It cannot be from a man and a man. We see the interdependence whereby they were to produce companionship and friendship. But where do we get the narrative that I am independent woman? I've heard of independent woman. Men don't confess. I think they're also independent, some of them. But truth be said, we are not independent, even though we seem that lots of things have been put to your head by others. We are interdependent to one another. Praise the Lord. One as if you were son. So there was an interdependent, there was a relationship that was happening between um, a man and a woman. And that is what God desires. When other things happen, you realize there is a gap. There is a gap. The gap, men of who are scholars, we do what we call gap analysis. There is always a gap for every study, they say. So when we actually go away from the plan of God, we have a gap. And that gap produces the denial making even me seeking to wonder, can I preach this message? Now that many of our marriages have not worked, or sometimes the nature itself has taken away your spouse. You know, God decided to be with your spouse. So you are actually a single person, or you are divorcee or divorced. What happened there? It doesn't mean you need to, des to de decline the, 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 the design of God. Marriage is the beginning of family. So when you talk about family, we cannot divorce it from marriage. I should also give a disclaimer. I'm not speaking this because I have Ross and you don't have somebody. Ross is my wife. I'm speaking this because when I read the Bible, I realized God esteemed the family. And I came from a single parent family. I mentioned, she mentioned in the past service, I lived with my father for only two years. And the rest, I didn't. But I grew up not knowing how good to be a family. I lived with my uncles in what I didn't know that this was an extended family. So I would hear people call about daddy, daddy, daddy. So every day I needed something and I called my uncle daddy. And I was reminded it's not your daddy. Actually, daddy for some of us is like a name because it is a name for seven and years and below. When children grow up is when they realize it's an office. I'll preach that in another day. So they told me, this is your uncle, your dad. It's not here. And the quest and pursuit of my father started. And I can tell you, as I started to ask my mother, my mother told me, never look for him. You are OK because you are home. And this is what many of us do. And we have made it to look like it's normal. Actually, I'm telling you, it's not. God is that. But the inherent desire for all of us to see our father, for all of us to see the ideal family, makes us to pursue things even against our parents. The president of United States wrote the book, In the Pursuit of My African Roots. He woke up one day and he said, I would want to know where my father is. And that is how he ended up to come to Kogelo in Syria. What that tells you is that every person desired to see the plan and the route where they came from. And I followed the same against the backdrop of my mother. Took me many years, about four years. And actually, at one point, she threatened me with death, which some of you do. He said, the day you find him, you die. Or if you find him, don't eat with him or eat in his house. Unfortunately, you know, I was traveling from Nairobi. I had some friends of ours. I told you the first service that I was very clever. I didn't use the people from Sitam. I used a friend of mine. We were learning with him from Sudan. And a friend of mine was a pastor from Meru. 
So when we go to the border, he looks like he was sharing like the people from Somalia. He was stopped at the border. Some of us just passed the border, but some of us on the look. So we delayed on the border, by the way. And then we were able to get some routes. I realized my father had changed some names. I got my father late in the evening, around five. We are fatigued. Our money is over out of riding the motorbike because there are places we are telling him move from this place to this place. And then the food was served to us. I had to choose to die hunger or die the dry spell. The, the spell of, uh, of, of missing my dad. I chose I would rather die when I'm full. I asked one of the pastors and say, please make a prayer of preservation. There's some prayers some of you need to learn to pray. You know, you just pray anything. We prayed a prayer of preservation. Who oh, are hungry? I remember my sister, my step sister made pilau. Wow. I don't like rice. That day, rice sounded sweet. I sat down and I said, Lord, may I eat this and may I live. <laughs> the rest is history. Today, I preach to you. I met in the home of my dad against the backdrop of my mother. But every person seeks to be in a family where they see a father and they see a mother. And that is the truth. When all is not going well, when we are saying, Pastor, let's just, things have become difficult, let's not accept it. It is against the God's design. And that marriage was designed for companionship. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. When companionship, which is friendship, is broken, it makes us to live in denial and bitterness, telling our children that don't grow up to be married. In fact, one of the things I told you, our children will be going to school. When you are growing up, I think which our teachers and our mentors told us that go to school and learn. After you finish, you reach class seven, you'll be circumcised. And then you go to high school, you go to campus, you look for a job, you'll be stable, and you get married. Now, getting married is now, some of you are, you are withdrawing because of our experience. I'm here to speak to us, our grandmothers, our mothers, and our children. You need to go and say that it was designed for companionship. And those of us who are not making companionship, seek to do that, and God will bless you. Marriage was meant for protection. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when it talks about you go and fill the earth and subdue it. He was to protect the lineage. It was to be interdependent that we will be able to say a family or what we call in the marriage setup, we are seeing protection of two people. It was for service. It talks about to subdue the earth and fill the earth. We are here to serve humanity. Every time you ask yourself as a family, which is the smallest unit as I've defined, are you serving humanity? I and my family, when you come here, do you release your spouses? You release your, your children to serve God. They were to subdue. It was not just to be there. When he created everything and he said, and subdue, there were things that were created before man came to live. But after that, when God creates man and creates the wife, he says, and you will subdue the earth. So in the family setup, when we have our marriage, it was not just meant for us, it was for service. And when you do that, it's a blessing. Marriage was for everybody. I want us to be able to read the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, quickly. Because some of us think it was meant for others. While we are trying to say and theologize and say, what does Paul mean that those who desire to be like me, please stay like that? And it's a conversation that is on a higher level, even us within Satan. How can actually single people stay unmarried and serve the Lord? I want to tell you, God desired that every person be married. There were not only special people who want to be pastors and elders. It was every person. Chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says this. Chapter 3, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. He's speaking that there were people that were actually teaching people, for, don't eat this food, don't do this, the narrative of them. God intended that all of us, if God gives chance, be able to get that. And so if things don't work, that is not a prescription. We say in theology that actually your experiences should not validate who God is. By virtue that some of us have gone through a dark past, does not validate or invalidate who God is. God is truth is premised on his word. Amen. 
Some of us is just an iota of who God is. He has used experiences to reveal. And some of our experiences actually are not full with the full things of God. It's only the grace of God that comes and covers that. So when things don't work in our family, let's not generalize and think that that is the ideal. The ideal was all of us need to get to the place where we are in a family. And in a family, I mean, where all of us, by any chance, you get married. Our senior singles were here. If you were desiring to get married, don't think it's a bad thing. It's a good commended. She must be received with thanksgiving. Yeah? It's a good thing. Amen? And it's a good thing that we want to know. God designed that all of you be married. What is God's prescription in this particular kind of a, this, or a family and setup of marriage? God forbids marriage between a believer and a non or unbeliever. He says, uh, let's read 2 Corinthians quickly. I have very few verses with us here. 2 Corinthians um, chapter two, 6, verse 14. Uh, the Bible says this, 2 Corinthians. We could just turn there quickly. Chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can line have with darkness? In God's prescription for us, marriage is that the two will walk together. And therefore, it is not God to desire for you. If you are some of us who are single here, you have found a good man. We get that in a counseling. But he's not born again. He's a no, no, go son. Are we together? He does not come to church. He goes to another religion. He's a no, no zone. Go zone. You need, they must agree where they are supposed to go. And that, I'm saying this to help us to understand that even when you come to be wedded, I will ask whether you're a believer or not a believer. If two of you are believers, I can join you. We can join you. If two of you are non-believers, we will join you still. But we will never join you with a believer and a non-believer. Because two cannot work together unless they agree. What I do is that I ask the non-believer to go and consider their ways because I may not ask the believer to backslide. Because the only thing to save my ship is to say, Murite, run for your life, my believing person. Praise the Lord. So I will not ask the, the because some of you say, can I backslide? And that some of you have done. Actually, by the way, when a believer marries an unbeliever, you become a former believer. That is English. So you can come. And it is just basic like that. So if you are a believer and you backslide or you go back to marriage, you become a former believer. So when you come back for counseling after your marriage and tell us that, you know, I was born again, I went there, and then I will consider you as a former Christian. So we help you get back. God forbids marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. But God, again, forbids marriage between persons of the same sex. He created man and, and, and this. We have had so many things. Thank God for the courts of Kenya. They have given you what is truth, or what they consider to be, or what do you call it? They consider to be balance. But in the Bible, God forbids same-sex marriages. If you are a believer, it's, it's against the doctrine of the church. You will go there, and I'll be mentioning a point immediately after this. You will think that it's acceptable, but it is not approved by God. You go and live your own self like the people who lived during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. In God's prescription, God forbids marriage for the already married. Where we have read, it says, even those of you who have divorced, if you, somebody marries you and you're just marrying somebody's wife, in fact, the day you die, if you remain African, we will sit to ask, who is your husband or who is your wife? If they remain married, and if you marry your divorcee, hakikufa watauliza tumuzike wapi, utaona wazewa na crack kichwa sana, watazunguka boma flan, and they will get wisdom. In some places, they will return some cows. That's how serious it is. Now, Jesus speaks and he says, whoever marries a divorcee, actually, you have married somebody's wife. <laughs> and so what do you do? You have committed adultery. Now, that is the same way that even if you are here and you are planning to get married, somebody's married. It's the same thing. 
But Jesus takes the bar very high. But the world has moved in a place where people even are doing temporary separation. And people are getting married. Mutu anatroka tu wiki moja, unampata kuingine, my brother. Nikubaya. Wanasema soko, chafu. Vijana wanasema hivo. Just one week. Yani ni kama alikuwa na panga akiwa kwako. Brethren, it's a family man's. We want to bring the house of order well. Yani na disappear, we unafikira reconciliation. Anakuambia nilichoka. Iki, two, two weeks. God forbids marriage for that. But there is a more interesting thing that I want men of us to introspect, particularly men of us who have known Solomon at their marriage. This was actually our someone during dinner and Martin, they were here to give thanks in the first service. God recognized all marriages. Yani those of us who married uh, in every way, God does not invalidate that. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20, that you remain in the situation where you are in. Maybe it could be a polygamous marriage. It could be that before you got born again, you are able to end a marriage. God is not asking, and even us as church, we are not asking you that you go and leave that spouse. God recognized that, but he doesn't approve every marriage. So when you come to do what you call Solomonization, is when you invite him in your life. Amen? Man and woman were to be interdependent. We were to depend on one another. I'm not overemphasizing this for some of us who are ladies who are working or are only one spouse is working. You sit together and agree. Because you see the man was lonely. The Bible says he was lonely until when the woman came and then he said, wow, the bone of my bone, bones. And then in the literature, guy once says, they say, this Adam didn't say, this is a woman. He called him another man. But he was saying, wow, man. So it was a wow woman. He didn't pronounce the last W. So it became, ooh, man. <laughs> it was a wow of interdependence. That again, I have found another. But this thing of things, others going separate, is something we talk in another conference. In the God structure that is none is superior, they were to be able to interdepend on each other. While the man was to lead, that is interdependence. I work here with a team of three pastors. It doesn't mean that when I'm a senior pastor. In fact, we were introducing the issue of lead pastors because some people thought they were senior, so they could not want to be accountable even to the ASC. Something we discussed anyway. Don't use against me. It's good titles to be senior. But now because I'm the one speaking, it doesn't mean that when you are senior, you are senior. Praise the Lord. You know you are the oldest? Yeah. Yes, and then <laughs> you on this side, sorry, these are my pastors I'm addressing. It is the same thing at home. You can value the ideas of your family, even your children. One of our pastors one day was asked by the daughter that I, I don't think you preach well. <laughs> you need to improve on your preaching. And that thing disturbed that pastor. The good thing, it was a month of May. You know the pastor. He confessed it when we were in Mombasa. My daughter asked me, and I thought you are the greatest preacher. That is what it means to lead. You are leading. And leaders can lead from the front or back, but they should always move with their entrance. Children in a family, which we are talking to as a part of us, as a blessing, it's a gift. When I talk about a blessing, it's a gift. We talked about this last time. When children don't come in any marriage, it's not a reason to invalidate that. And this goes to our grandfathers and our fathers here. When your children get married and you don't see any sign of them giving you children, that is not a reason to force them and tell them, please reconsider. Because that is where men actually get the reason to get remarried, even if they are in church. There was as you have told them, please, I want somebody after my name. You know, as they knows how to ask. They don't tell you go and remarry. They just say, aye. You can get someone, just give me a name, you know. And that really invalidates and makes some of our marriages to really stumble. Children are a gift in the marriages. God recognizes servants as integral part of the family. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 10, when Moses was giving the Ten Commandments, he asked them that on the seventh day, every person was to work 
And he gives that you neither your sons, neither your daughters, neither your servants. The servants in our homes are supposed to be regarded as part of us. When you're doing some shopping, regard them. Regard them. You heard the other day from my home country, Uganda, somebody, the AD camp shot the boss. And when I was looking at the comments, somebody said, please give your servants food or they will shot you. So some of us, you disregard your servants. Your bullet will find you there. <laughs> Treat them well. Treat them well. They are part of our family. And it's an integral part of the family. In the God structure, do not disregard those who wash and walk with us. My office sometimes is cleaned by people before we get. If I don't treat them well, you will never, because they actually access my office more than my pastors. Treat them well. Those people who wash for your cars, those who come to cut your fences, that is where your insecurity can come. It's part of our family, and you need to recognize that structure. And God's demand is that as husbands, we must love our wives. That is what Paul speaks to this church. We must love our wives, express love to our wives. I mentioned in the past service, and this I intended to say in both services, that there were men that used not to say anything to their wives. So at one point, they were in their men's conference, and they were asked to chat and tell their wives, I love you. And they were waiting for responses, and the responses were popping up. They were asking again, somebody being asked, again, someone asked, um, is the car broken down? And they asked, you want more money? That asks, what is? Question mark. Another asks, all those many things. It seems that love in many of our marriages has become extinct. You don't love our wives. Or else we don't express our love. So when you ask, or maybe we do love only when we want to take the vehicle to the garage, because they're asking, uh, has the car broken down? <laughs> okay. God expects us husbands to be considerate to our wives. That's First Peter chapter 3. You need to be considerate towards our wives, and that is a blessing to us. I want to move very fast. In God's demand, he expects us children to obey and honor their parents. Children who are here, if you are 18 years and below, God's expectation to you in his family in this design is that obey your parents and honor them. You obey them. They ask you to do this, you run. Let me give you a very weird example that somebody taught me. When I got born again, I was living with my uncle, who I called dad, and they refused. And he said, when he asks you to go and buy a cigarette, you are still under, you go and buy, but pray for him. It's not a good example. You need to obey. Until the day you get a genius, and you leave your house, and you form your nuclear family, go and do your own things. You need to obey and see what your parents. If you find it difficult, you come and talk to pastor very nicely. We know how to talk to your parents. Don't disobey your parents. But for us who are adults, all of us, God expects us to honor our parents. Honor. Honor where it's due. Many of us, God has blessed us with drive good vehicles. But when we go to our villages, our parents don't have any HIF at 200 something. They get sick. It's when we come here and we realize that they cannot afford anything. Honor them when they get old. Buy for them something, shopping every month. We tried. We are not going to use our example. But even on your paycheck, you make something for your parents. I know that many of us have get a place. We are so individualistic. I cannot actually associate you with your father. It's not good. God expects you in the family, in the extended. We are Africans to honor our parents. Buy them a blanket. You have many blankets and duvets. Carry some of them that you have been given as a gift and take them to your father. Let them feel that my son is there. A shirt. Buy a good shirt and take it to your father. It's a sign of honor. God expects you to do that. One as if you were son. Some of them walk when you're on bare foot at this age. In the family, we honor our parents. Buy them a good dress. Try to take them out. Hallelujah. I know this one I should not teach you today. But how many of us have taken our parents out? Oh my goodness. We need to take them out. You know, 
Our wives only take us as, when are you taking us out? I want to tell you, it's good to honor your parents. Even if they are not born again, honor your parents. Walk there one day and pray for them as if they are born again and they say, today, dad, I want you to get this. Today, mom, I want you to do this. God expects you to do that in the blueprint of family. Honor was there. And they will speak a blessing to you. And our parents, God does not expect you to expirate our children, but to train them in the way of God. In this design, we were to love our children. We were to walk with them. I know many of us, I say this in the parenting, and you found it so difficult to do. Wake up, some of our fathers, hug our children, and pray a blessing to them. Train them in the ways they are supposed to be able to walk with the Lord, and that will be a blessing. He expects us to do that. Some of us are actually tyrants. When our voices are hard at home, everybody scatters. When you just come and they hear the, the vehicle is coming, everybody keeps quiet and they wait when that will be a way for them to have peace. God expects you in the family that you'll be able to train your children. Don't expect it. Don't be a tyrant at home. God expects you to do something. I want to conclude uh, quickly. God expects every servant. For many of us who are servants, I've talked to your bosses. You are here. You need to be able to reward me. But now I want to address you servants in the family. You are expected to obey and respect your masters. To the latter. Amen. Yeah, it's disloyal masters here. There was a friend of mine here, a good Masai. Thank you for Masai in the house. My professor, you know, take me offense. I see where you are seated. Yeah, thank you. So he was told this soldier was a Masai that do not open the door for anyone. And then the wife came and they didn't open the door. And then the wife reported him to the head of the house, H O H. And then he was asked, he said, you told me not to open for anyone. He's someone. And then there was war in that house. The husband remembered actually. This man was obedient to the latter. So he debated whether he did. The wife said, he, he, he has disobeyed me. Well, the man was sacked. But the example here is, please, if you are a servant, take the orders to the latter. Obey and respect your masters. In Jesus' name, for your long life. Otherwise, we will, you will find many things. And go always clarify what the context it means, and God will bless you. You are in a part of that family to serve them. At one point, God will release you. It's very difficult, particularly for those of you who stay with servants, to see how you can keep them for longer. Because there are times when a mere pembe, they become unfaithful. But for you who is here, be faithful and obey your masters. You are a driver. Don't go and... Yeah, you know, some of us, them go to make for us vehicles. You come back, one item is not there. Please be faithful in that family. Do what is right. I want to address you, you're part of the family, and God expects you to do that, and I wanted to say that. And for us who are masters, we need to be kind not to threaten our servants. Those of us who work for us, don't threaten them because you pay them the money. Hmm? One of them employed one of my friends, my friend was bereaved, so he asked for permission to go and bury and said, choose between work and the burial. <laughs> ah, it's very difficult. Please be kind. I don't know the answer to that, and many of you do that. God is asking us in the family context to be kind and not threaten the servants. They will reduce your salary. I will send you home, mama, when you are up. No, it's 12 at night. I saw somebody tell you, you go home now <laughs> at night. And somebody come from Machakos or come to Naro. Say, who see who, who, when the new man? And many of you, chukwa items, naweka inje, mutu anasimama inje, naona jiran. Please, if you are a family, this is what we are preaching. This is what we are teaching. Let's be you men. Let's know we are together. Even in the church context, if our family will be strong, we'll be able to have good. I want to conclude by saying, that God's family, God's purpose for family is marriage. It's difficult for me to conclude this. It's not a mistake of English. I searched and I've told you that even in the denial when my mother was telling me, never look for my dad, she was living in denial. And many of us are living in denial of marriage. God did not intend any of us to be a widower. God did not intend anyone to be a divorcee. God did not intend any one of us to remain senior single for life. 
as Paul might have chosen at one point. God did not intend any of us to be a widow or a separated person. Nature of life has put us there. So initially, God wanted a man and a woman to have a companionship. There is something sweet that happens when you are together. Um, sometimes when we differ with my wife sometimes, you cannot work. Amen. I don't know how to differ with my wife. I don't know how to do it. Nasikia ni kama uendelee tu kuomba kama mimi sijui nyinyi mnafanya nini nasikia tu kuomba mm? unatafuta nyimbo umenipatia 50 songs they will help me mm -hmm. It's difficult my brother and these things happening many of us men we are suffering mental illness nyumbani hakuna peace many guys who are in the bus drinking na pitanga i towns asingine kutoka visitation na Nairobi wanaume ndio wako town hapa na wanacheza tu muziki na ana lamba tu chupa hata hawajaji anashangaa ataenda nyumbani namna gani we want to make peace at home and i'm telling you we will reduce many of mental sick sicknesses and even pubs will close because when marriage is not working we will find a way najua wanaume atujii kubishana ladies i will tell you mna we are not strong vitu zikiwa ngumu we just we walk away. No, 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 my car, come away to now. Okay, get I'm a man, I'm speaking to you. Do you tonight, tonight, to the machine to a good jamu to and be a name? Una mutu and end on a car to come away. Bagagioni. I get better at picking in peace at home. Anyway, ladies, also, let's see what we can work in this. God desire. If peace will be there, would a fry crude in man. Ukiona mtu anafurahia kwenda nyumba mambo iko. Ukiona mtu anakaa kwa ofisi, ukiona anakaa kwa ofisi sana, kuja niombe. I must go home. Hm? Pano va mentor told us, please, na wale mnanipelekanga lunch na dinner msikie hii. Eat anything anywhere, but not dinner. Eat, if you eat elsewhere dinner, eat home again. Na wanawake please, ensure men eat home. Ukiona akuli, muulize what is the problem. And men please go and eat. If you have eaten elsewhere, I tell you eat home again. Amen. God designed the family to extend. It was to be big. It's supposed to have maid servants. It's supposed to have children. It has to be many blessings. It is a design of God. If they don't come, it's okay. But the desire of God was that we fill the earth and be there. And there are many ways I've told you to do that. Let the family extend. Let the family flourish. Eat together. Many of you are doing well in the family get together. Do it. It's God's plan for marriage. Marriage in the context of his family, of God's kingdom, God's plan, is his, his kingdom. It is his fear of oppression. They say actually strong families makes a basis for a stronger church, and a stronger church makes a stronger society. The church and the community are weakening every day. Marriage is weakening. And thus the kingdom of God looks to be like it's in shambles. I invite us to reconsider this. Some of us who are young desire to get there and be able to be committed. When I was getting married, I, t I told the first half, this is the last statement I want to tell you. I was telling myself that I would also want to marry somebody who had a father and a mother. And it was a part of qualification for marrying Rose. So at one point when she met all the beauty, and I would say, I would also want somebody who understands how two can walk together and be together for life. Because for my mother, it was just like, a stint, a stint. Kuna mbiyo zina kibi wanga, tumbiyo kiangale hivu mwina ametangazo. Kwetu ilikuwa hivu. Na lose amepatikana. This thing of lose and get, I say, I would get that. I'm the only lawyer who has slept in my mother's lower home. My dad-in-law loves me. I drive there every day and I sleep there. 